Today, we have with us Alex Pototsky, a friend of mine and a fantastic reporter who's been all over the world. My name is Alex Pototsky. I'm a roving reporter. Right now, I'm in Pakistan on a special reporting assignment for the People Channel. Another factor at play here is the fact that Pakistan is one of the youngest nations in the world. It was established in 1956, so your grandparents are older than that. Of course, people lived here since prehistoric times, and Islam began to gain influence here only in the 8th century. For a long time, locals practiced Hinduism and worshipped Buddha. However, Islam forbids pictures or sculptures of holy people that look like people, and so radical Islamists of the Taliban movement began destroying such artifacts that are thousands of years old. You can see behind me the famous Buddha of Swat in a lotus position. That was carved at the base of a granite cliff in the 7th century. The Valley of Swat was a holy place of worship. There were thousands of Buddhist temples, stupas, monasteries and statues. And this image of Buddha was also carved in granite. But then everything changed. In 2007, the Pakistani Taliban took control over Swat and the first thing they did was to try and destroy this amazing Buddha carving. They used dynamite sticks to blow it up. But luckily, not all of them worked. The explosion didn't go as planned. Only some parts of this carving were damaged, including the head. The Pakistani Taliban, not to be confused with the Taliban in Afghanistan, took this area under control in 2007. They went on to destroy everything and everyone who did not fit their profile of true believers. The Taliban were in power for two years here during the war. They enacted too many very strict laws. But that wasn't even the worst. It was a war. There were bombings. And I had little children. So I had to move with my family. Many people suffered because of that war. Many were killed. Many became disabled. After the government forces defeated the local Taliban here in 2009, this carving was restored with the help of Italian archaeologists and art experts. So today, this effigy of Buddha looks like a thousand years ago. Are you subscribed to our channel? Not yet? The sad thing is that Anton can't go on his next adventure until you do. So pretty please, subscribe now. That's right. Go ahead, click subscribe. Well done and thank you. We can continue now. And then all of a sudden, an armed man stepped out of the bushes and he wasn't friendly at all. An official of some sort showed up with two armed soldiers, uh, an officer, and said that this place is dangerous for tourists because tourists attract attention and that this place is known to have been under the Taliban's control and that the Taliban blew up this carving and that the Taliban can be somewhere around even now in these mountains and they can simply come and take us and we won't be able to do anything about it and he is appointed to maintain security in this area so he tells us that we can't be here because it's not safe so basically this guy was trying to say that if our crew were to get killed or kidnapped he get in trouble with his bosses. That's because the Pakistani Taliban has never put up with their defeat. Terrorist attacks occur in the area every now and again, even today. When our crew was filming the gun factory in Peshawar, a terrorist attack occurred in the city. A suicide bombing targeting soldiers. One was killed, seven wounded. Last February, an explosion in a mosque took the lives of 38 policemen who came to pray there. The most appalling terrorist attack took place in 2014. It made headlines all over the world. Terrorists attacked a military school for children. They made no demands. They simply wanted to kill as many people as they could. That attack 
left 141 people dead, and it was compared by many to the Beslan massacre in Russia. And after that, the government of Pakistan reinstated the death penalty. My name is Lal Masik, and I am an executioner. I am 60 years old. I have hanged a total of over 700 people doing my job. I am Lal's brother. My name is Sadiq. I helped my brother hang people. These guys gave us their first interview. They are professional executioners, now retired. They worked in prison for over 30 years. I lived in Dubai. And when I returned home, they offered me this job. Our government gave me this job. Moratorium on death penalty was introduced in Pakistan only in 2008, when the government was actively seeking the support of the Western nations. After the attack on the school, the moratorium was lifted. These are the official numbers of how many people were hanged over the next five years in Pakistan. Seven in 2014. As many as 326 in 2015. 87 in 2016. 65 in 2017 and 14 in 2018. The Masik brothers were already retired at that time, but they say now that prior to 2008, there were a lot more executions. There always was a court order and an order signed by the prison chief, so I have no reason to feel guilty. I hanged people who had received their sentence. I didn't feel anything about it because it was my job. We hanged people who were criminals, murderers, rapists, terrorists. Our shift started at about 1 a.m. An inmate gets informed of the pending execution 24 hours in advance. He gets one day to say goodbye to his family or friends. One hour before the execution, he is taken to shower. After that, he has to put black clothes on. Then the guards put a black bag on his head and take him to us. It takes two men to execute someone. One man puts a rope around the man's neck and the other pulls the lever. Pulling the lever opens the floor under the man's feet and he falls down. I was the one to pull the lever. It's a very bad and painful way to die. Look, even when I push his neck slightly like this, it hurts. From what I saw, it usually took people two minutes to die. The rules dictate that we let the hanged men hang for half an hour. After that, I removed the body and put it on a table. Then the doctor had to come and confirm the death. Just listening to this makes my hair stand on end. The most scary part is how matter-of-factly they're talking about it. They even seem to be proud of their job because they worked for the government. I have a wife and seven children. And my children always knew that I hanged people because I brought money home, my salary. I gave them food. They knew that their father worked in prison hanging people. There was one man I still remember. When they brought him to us, he was happy. We said, we're going to hang you now, and he said, no problem. It's hard to call these two guys happy. It took us a long time to get them to agree to an interview because they're drunk most of the time, and many of their co-workers are using. To be honest, we live in constant fear. Half of my family lives in Malaysia because I'm scared for their lives. Every time I walk the streets or go by a mosque, I'm scared because any man in the street can come close and kill me. I killed many people, you know. It was my job. I became a Christian and now all I want is to go to hell. I don't belong in paradise. I did too many bad things in my life. We're in the valley of Swat, four hours away from Peshawar. This area is also inhabited by Pashtuns. And we came here because Ijaz, our Pashtun friend, invited us to be guests at his house. The tradition of hospitality around here goes all the way back before Islam came to the area. Hospitality is an important part of the Pashtun culture. And an invitation to visit a Pashtun family is a great way to discover how a regular Pashtun family lives. 
живет обычная пуштунская семья. Ijaz is the guy who introduced us to his cousin, an owner of a gunsmithing facility. The car couldn't go any further, so we got off and continued on foot. Were you born here, or you came to live here later? No, I was born here. Right. And how old is this village? Well, probably around 5,000 years old. 5,000 years old? Yes. So, this village was here before Islam spread to the valley of Swat. The streets are so narrow that hardly two people can squeeze in shoulder to shoulder. There's no way a car can fit in. Look, two girls were on their way across the streets. One ran by and the other one was stopped by someone. We were asked not to film the girls as they crossed, so I turned the camera down. As soon as the girls were on their way, Ijaz opened the door. Thank you. If you remember, he just spent some time studying in Russia. His father insisted that he return home because he said Russian women are beautiful and he could get spoiled. There's a very special code of conduct here when it comes to women. For example, right now, he just invited us to his guest room. This is our guest room. It's for men only. But say, if a family comes to visit me, the man of the family and I, i.e. men only, will spend time together in this room, talking, chilling. In the evening when I leave, my guest's wife and children can also stay in this room. And whenever I need to go through this room on my way out, I will look down on the floor and not to look at his wife. And whenever I come back, I'll knock first before entering to give the woman some time to leave. This is our culture. His daughter is playing with him in this room. Her name is Usaya, but she is only allowed in here while she's little. As soon as she turns 12, she will wear a burqa and won't ever be in the company of strange men. Ijaz has two wives, and one lives separately from the family. My first wife's mother is sick, so my wife used to spend a lot of time taking care of her. But who will take care of our children? Who will cook? I couldn't allow this. I said, if you knew about this problem, why did you arrange for her to marry me? I need my wife here. So I decided to marry again so another wife would give me a son and live here on my land. Oh well, it didn't work out between you. It happens. But why not divorce? That's impossible. People will point fingers at you. They will judge you. Divorce is impossible for us. Divorce is Satan's doing. That's what it is. If someone agrees to divorce, it's good news for Satan because it means he has won. If there is a divorce, there will be a conflict and it may even lead to death. The scariest thing is that all this isn't just some talk about traditions, it's the reality people live in. Conflicts often occur between the families of a married couple and they can get ugly, with fighting and even armed fighting. And knowing this, many husbands prefer to solve the problem quietly. Guys, if you like my video and if you like what we are doing, I would really appreciate if you support us on Patreon, on Pioneer or on PayPal and we try to make even more great films from new dangerous places for you. Thank you. All the links are in the description. Please donate. She doesn't want to get married, just burn it. She wants to get divorced, just burn it. She is bearing only daughters, just burn it. We're in a beauty parlor with mirrors, lighting, cameras. A makeup artist is prepping a model for a photo shoot. Look at her. Her name is Narin. She's 42, but she looks a lot younger. A really beautiful and graceful woman. But take a closer look. Her eye is missing. Whenever I go out, cross for shopping or for another reason, I wear glasses. I never cover my face at work. When women ask me, I tell them. But not many ask because they all know anyway. Nadin has three children. They were very poor, but her husband couldn't care less. He simply spent all days at home. I was begging him, please find work, you've got children, they need food. I made him very angry and he still did nothing. My father talked to him and he said, if you don't take care of my daughter and her children, we'll find someone who will. In the end, Narin's family talked her husband into giving her a divorce. Three months later, things started to get better. One morning, Narin was getting ready to go to work. She had to take her eldest daughters to school on the way. Someone entered the house. She turned around and saw her ex-husband. The last thing she noticed was a glass jar in his hand. Then. Everything went dark, 
She felt insufferable pain and heard her daughter crying. He threw acid in my face. I can't describe the pain I suffered. I felt like I was burning alive. My children were crying next to me. They told me later that drops of acid fell on their hands. Then my neighbors came, called an ambulance, and I was taken to a hospital. The acid basically melted your skin. It, it is like when acid, you throw acid on someone, the skin get started to get melted. So how could you get the courage to do this to someone I work so long for her, but I still don't get it. Fawa works at a foundation that helps the survivors of acid attacks. They say survivors, they don't use the word victims in here. I met a patient, his name is, her name is Najaf. And uh, I wasn't uh, expecting it that bad. It was my first, I was new. And uh, she came to hospital, I booked a room uh, for her surgery there. She came early before me and I was like opening the door and the moment I look at her, I closed the door again. I was outside and it took 10 minutes to swallow the thing. There was no face. But actually there was no face. There was two hollow eyes. Eh? She was at time, I guess, just 18 years old. I was married and my husband cheated on me all the time. Then he decided to marry again and he simply kicked me out of his house one day. I returned to my parents and lived with them for three months. Then his father came and made a deal with my father that I would come back to him. I agreed to his second marriage. He stopped coming back home for a while. One night at 9 p.m. when Sophia and her three children were about to go to bed, her husband finally showed up. He seemed excited and happy and brought a big bottle of soda. Later, they found out he had dissolved 81 sleeping pills in that bottle. When Sophia and the children fell asleep, he poured acid over them and then some petrol. He set them on fire and locked the door from the outside. He had put a lot of pills into the soda, so at first I didn't feel anything. I was woken up by my children's cries for help. The house was on fire, I was on fire, my children too. The neighbors came, kicked the door open and called an ambulance. The doctor said that two of the younger children had 90% of their bodies severely burned. One daughter had 50% of her body burned. Ten days later, the two of the younger kids died at the hospital. My burns were so bad that bones on my hands were burned too. Acid attack basically is a heinous crime. Uh, it, people usually done this to end the life of any female because for a female's face, is, it's all about his beauty. Uh, when you are a female, your beauty, your face, your personality is everything to you. Uh, so it, it only uh, does bad to you. It, it steals your personality. Uh, it's very easy to get acid in Pakistan, so... And the worst thing is that most of the time, women don't go to the police. Families put pressure on them not to. Most of the females doesn't file a case uh, due to a family pressure, as you uh, talked about Sakina. He it does an FIR, uh, he tried to uh, court the culprit, but his husband doesn't uh, want this to be happened, so it never happened. Um, but if you uh, go through the whole process, if you uh, uh, pay your faith in the judiciary, so it can be happen. One get a 60 years imprisonment, uh, other get a seven year imprisonment. This foundation has been working in Pakistan for 18 years now, and they help women undergo up to 100 plastic surgeries per year. They help women get back to life, find work and live again. Some women learn to make jewelry like this and sell it. There are lots of photos of women who have received help here at the foundation. Most of them are smiling. The foundation's slogan is, smile again. The man who did this to me has almost served his sentence. He will soon be released. We might walk into each other in the street. I'm not going to do anything about it. I hope God will take care of it. I believe that God will punish him with problems. I am not married and I understand that I will never get married again. But I have my small business and my daughter is going to get married soon. 
Today, I simply want to develop my business and take care of my children. God gave me a second chance in life, and today I can take care of my children. They're all grown up now, and going to marry soon. My dream is to see them grow and be happy. I simply want to live beside them and be happy for them. That's the kind of dreams people have here. Nothing like a new iPhone or a car or a trip abroad or an improved skill set. They simply want to live. And people like this are often capable of finding joy in the simplest things and feeling happy a lot better than many of us. For example, here, a carnivore came to a local village. It's just a bunch of rusty old attractions in the dirt, yet look how happy the kids are. Street food kiosks are making food basically on the floor and people buy it, enjoy it, and love it, even though pesky flies keep flying into every plate. You can't eat anything here without flies trying it first. But the truth is, you get used to the flies in Pakistan fairly quickly. So, I'm gonna stir my treat. I think it's a dessert. Okay, I'm ready. You only die once. Mm. In fact, it's really good. It's very refreshing because of the ice, especially in this heat. So, at this time of the day, I'd say it's the food of the gods. It's also sweet, very sweet. It's really a dessert. I'd say it'd be even better without this kind of pasta. The Pakistani variety of pasta, whatever it's called. Because pasta is for savory taste, not for sweet taste. At least that's how I feel about it. Which is why I'm not really a fan of this Pakistani pasta here. It's gorgeous. Just need to lose the pasta. The rest is perfect. This special kind of milk, the syrup, the ice, ah. And I'm sharing my dessert with the flies. By the way, our guide warned me that I shouldn't eat it, although it was already too late. Because they used local non-bottled unfiltered water to make the ice, so he said I might end up having stomach problems because of it. The biggest attraction here is this huge barrel-shaped track the size of a tall house. It's called the Well of Death. So in short, the Well of Death is a big barrel-shaped cylinder made of wooden planks. And inside, motorcyclists travel along the vertical wall and perform stunts. It's called a well of death because this variety of stunts are considered a lethal risk. The riders start at the bottom of the drum, in the center, and ascend to an initial ramped section until they gain enough speed to drive horizontally to the floor. And you can see the drum is literally made of planks. After a while, they go so fast they almost reach the viewers at the top. One of them managed to rip a money bill out of a viewer's hand. Another one let his steering wheel go and he's riding with no hands. It blows my mind just to watch this. But Alex wanted more and actually walked into this well of death. I am inside this drum. This motodrome where, as you can see, these stuntmen are riding in circles. It looks incredibly cool and incredibly dangerous. I'm in awe. How do they do it? I fell down a few times. Here, I've got a scar on my head. I also broke a leg before that. Last year, a guy I worked with fell down and died right before my eyes. But I've got five children, and I work here because I have no choice. I need to feed them and give them education. And of course, they sell souvenirs here, but not only that, check it out. You can get a tattoo, and they have a huge choice. They have geometry, guns, lions, which brings back my memories of the 1990s in Russia. We decided to pay for a tattoo as a gift to one of the guys. 
It costs less than a dollar, and look how they make it. The artist begins his work right away. There's no preparation, no design transfer. A few minutes later, the tattoo is ready. It's very far from anything close to perfect, but our guy seems to be happy with it. That was so gross. Well, you saw it all with your own eyes. You can still see it. The ink is dripping, the blood is dripping, there's been no disinfection. No one bothered to remove the hair. It's one of those brutally applied tattoos I've ever seen in my life. And while everyone was having fun, I noticed these little bumps of earth around. And then it turned out that this carnival was in fact running right in the middle of a cemetery. And right next to it is a tomb of a holy man, and today is a celebration of his passing. We are now in a Sufi shrine. It's a tomb of a Sufi holy man. It says on the tomb that he died 8,000 years ago, and that's where he's buried. As it turns out, Sufis don't believe in death. They believe that after a life on Earth, they go to some other world. So today, everyone is celebrating this holy man's passing to another world. After the prayer, the men went to a large hall. And then the noisiest part of the ceremony started with the arrival of the drummers. In Pakistan, all musical instruments like violins or horns are forbidden by Islam, except the drums. The drum beat is getting faster, one drummer starts spinning, and people begin going into a trance. If you look closer, all this looks a lot like a rave party, only they call it a prayer. We showed you the scary side of Pakistan, although as any other country, it has a sunny side too. In our next program, we'll show you how people settle border disputes by dancing, how medics perform surgeries in the streets, and how Pakistani have fun and chill out. Subscribe to our channel.